So welcome everybody um, to this public lecture series organized by the Singapore University of Social Sciences. Um, with us today, we have Professor Jennifer Zosh and I'll uh, just do a very quick introduction so that she can have most of this time with us. Um, towards the end, we will have time for question and answer. Um, for, in order to make this a little bit more interactive, I would encourage people to unmute themselves and speak up. There's also the emoticon, uh, hand raising emoticon. If you feel like, you know, oh, many people want to speak, then use that so that we know you're in, a, in the queue. Um, and uh, we do have a backup sort of a slido prepared, you know, in case people prefer to do that. Otherwise, if there aren't, you know, too many, too many questions, I think, you know, we'll utilize both the chat box as well as have you unmute yourselves to speak. It's always nice to hear people's voices and see their faces. Okay, so welcome again. So Professor Jennifer Zosh uh, is currently a professor of human development and family studies at Pennsylvania State University's Brandywine campus in the USA. And she's also the director of the Brandywine Child Development Lab, where she studies how infants and young children learn about the world around them. And so she's here today to um, tell us more about playful learning, which is something that here at SUSS, we are also fiercely trying to promote. But we know that the translations of you know, playful learning, allowing engaging children through playful learning is not an easy task. It requires adults to you know, be quite skillful at the same time, be quite patient and engaged as well. So over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being here with us. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this invitation. Um, and thank you so much to the Singapore University of Social Sciences for inviting me to speak with you all today. I must admit, I'm feeling very lucky to be in the Zoom room with all of you in a room full of so many people that I know are working so hard to make children's lives better and frankly, already are. Whether you're working in the classroom, whether you're parents, whether you're an administrator, whether you're learning so that you can walk into that classroom, I think you're all doing important work already. So what I wanna do today is talk with you a little bit about how I'm thinking about how we can support this youngest generation to help them live in a world better than the one that we have now. So I wanna harness this optimism about making tomorrow better and tell you a little bit about some of the latest and greatest science that's fully supportive of the idea that today's children in our society already have the powerful tools necessary to support holistic child development. We know a lot about what activities, what kinds of activities we can do to support children, and it might be a little different than you might think. But first, I want to set the stage by presenting two very important challenges or contexts for today's children. I think it's really important to acknowledge that the job of today's educators is different than I think it's ever been before. I can't think of a time in history in which the future is so unknown, right? I think for a long time, people have thought, hmm, 50 years from now, we don't know what the future is gonna be. I think that we're living in a time where we don't know what five, 10, 20 years in the future is going to be. And I think today's teachers and parents need to prepare our children for a tomorrow that we can't even fully imagine from self-driving cars to artificial intelligence to jobs and occupations that have not even yet been invented to the metaverse. The challenge that we face is how do we best prepare our children for an unknown future? And at the same time, we're also tasked with preparing children for today. We want our children to learn to be deep thinkers, to leave each year and each grade learning all that they possibly can. We want them to excel inside and outside of the classroom, knowing that what we're doing in these early years helps build a foundation for all that's to come. How our children do early on, we know, helps set the stage for them as they enter adolescence, adulthood, and that uncertain future. So that's a lot of pressure for teachers, for parents, for children. So you may have noticed that I frame these as a little bit of competing challenges, the challenge of preparing today's children for success in an unknown future while also equipping them for success today. I haven't phrased them as problems. And that's because I'm a strengths-based person and I actually see both adults and children as up to the task of facing these challenges head on. 
These are not impossible tasks. I think children are equipped with everything that they need for success today and to excel in tomorrow's unknown. I think that their equipment is twofold. They're equipped with incredible power. And I think part of that power comes from their innate drives to play. And second, I think that they can harness one of the most important resources that there are, the people around them. The importance of the people around them cannot be understated. And that's where I think all of you come in. You're shaping the world, you're shaping tomorrow's world, and you're shaping the world for today's children. So what I want to do in this talk is talk a little bit about the power of play and the role of others in supporting children today and preparing them for tomorrow. But first, I think it's important to think a little bit more critically about what we mean when we think about the goals of education. I think that we're a little bit at a crossroads in which we really have to start to evaluate how and why we're educating children. In the traditional way that we've approached education for the for the last few decades, there's been such a big focus on content, making sure that there's a focus on reading, writing, mathematics, science, making sure that children walk out with the content that we need them to learn. And I understand that, that makes sense. Children do need to learn content, right? Anyone who's talked to a four-year-old that needs to learn to read, needs to learn to read and needs to learn to write. But I think we also wanna think about if that's enough, and I think the 21st century approach to thinking about education is supporting children to acquire, acquire that content, but also to be happy, healthy, thinking, caring, and social beings so that they become the collaborative, creative, competent, and responsible citizens of tomorrow. So I think we really need to think about how do we get there, right? If we think that this is the way that we want to help our children succeed both today and in that unknown future, how do we get them there? And what is it they really need to know? So I think a really great um, place to start, here we go, is a really useful framework that's given to us um, in thinking about the 21st century approach to education by Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and Roberta Golenkoff. They call their models the six C's and highlight a breadth of skills approach to thinking about the skills necessary for a changing world. They highlight that for both success today and in the future, children need the following skill set. First, children need to learn the skill of collaboration so that they're able to understand the importance of and develop the skill set to collaborate with those around them. Whether it's building a block tower with a peer or working together on a calculus problem or working together to solve the next pandemic or global warming, the science and skills of collaboration are critical for both today and tomorrow. Another important skill is that of communication learning how to communicate one's own ideas, listening to others, and communicating our thoughts, our feelings, our ideas. Importantly, they also, this model does not ignore the importance of content. The argument is not that content is not important and that that isn't what we shouldn't be doing in kids with children in school, but that content is just one skill within a dynamic suite of skills that's necessary for today and for tomorrow. In a world in which content is available like never before, when we can quickly pull up information literally at our fingertips, it is still important for children to understand and acquire content knowledge, but it's simply not enough. So it's just one of the C's in this breadth of skills approach. Importantly, we also need children to develop the skills of critical thinking. They need to understand not just that information exists, but how to critically evaluate it, use it, think about the ways in which information connects and be able to evaluate the trustworthiness of that information. So it's important not just to have the information or have the content, but be able to process and evaluate that information as well. Importantly, it's not just enough to have the information or access it or be able to think about how it connects. You also need to be able to generate new ideas and express creative innovation. Like I said, today's children will be faced with challenges that are huge, some of which we know about and some we can't even, we can't even guess at. So whether it's solving climate change, facing a pandemic, curing cancer, thinking about new ways of existing in an ever-changing world, we want our children to be creative innovators. And finally, children need to develop the confidence that they will need to face today's and tomorrow's challenges. It's, it's hard, right? It's hard to think about facing challenges and facing failure, but children need to be able to face that failure, learn from it, and come back stronger. They need the confidence to express their ideas, try out new and unusual solutions, and have the confidence to realize that not everything may work, but it's still important to try and learn from our mistakes. Importantly, these six C's are not just a, you have it or you don't. It's not like a checkbox that you turn six and a half and boom, you have confidence, right? These are all skills that 
that grow and progress over time. Children and adults are constantly engaging in the world and with each other in new ways. And I think that one of the things that we can do, and I'll return back to this grid a little later on, is think about how where children are now and how we might be able to get them to that next level. So a little bit more on that later. So now that we've developed this framework for thinking about the goals of 21st century education, the question becomes how? How is it that we can support children's acquisition of the six C's? How is it that we're able to support children in learning not just content, but the skills that they need for tomorrow's unknown future? Luckily, I think that there's an answer. Over the last few decades, a new type of scientific study has come into focus, the science of learning. This area of study brings together research and insights from psychology, education, computer science, machine learning, linguistics, cognitive science, and others to truly examine how people learn. In fact, if you're interested in this topic, there's a couple of books that are, there's lots and lots of writing about this, but there's two books that are really comprehensive in this area. How People Learn was the original and How People Learn Two came out just a few years ago. So those are great resources to check out if you want some more information. So given that all this research is giving us insight that we've never had before, my colleagues and I have wanted to think about how do we harness how people learn, right? How do we harness that in children's lives? So as developmental researchers, we're, we were interested in determining exactly what kind of thinking, what kind of experiences lead to increased learning for children. So we all got into this field because we have a fat passion for, for supporting development. So now we set our sights on children's learning. So here's a quote from one of those books. It says, the new science of learning is beginning to provide knowledge to improve significantly people's abilities to become active learners who seek to understand complex subject matter and are better prepared to transfer what they've learned to new problems and settings. Sounds a little bit like the six C's. And what, so what is that knowledge, right? What has it told us? What does the science of learning suggest is the way for us to support the acquisition of the six C's and prepare children for success today and tomorrow? The answer, I argue, is playful learning. The science of learning is suggesting that we already have the tools we need to help prepare children for success today and for tomorrow. It's already available to us. Namely, it's a pedagogy that's based in playful learning. And we know that children are naturally drawn to play. It turns out that this natural inclination to play is not something that's special to human, Humans alone, work by Burkhardt and others has suggested that play is an innate drive beyond just humans. Octopuses, some birds, and other species naturally play as a way to learn about their worlds. And this is something I can't stress enough. Play is a way to learn about the world, no matter what that world looks like. And this is the reason why children will not just be okay in today's changing world and tomorrow's unknown future. Children can use play, and frankly so can adults, but we can all use play, something that's natural to us, to learn and succeed in any world. Children are using play today to learn, through their, learn about and learn through their experiences, even when those experiences are different than the ones we have. But there's one piece of the puzzle that we haven't exactly addressed yet, and I think it's addressing this piece of the puzzle that's really key, because sometimes there's lots of resistance to thinking that play and playful learning is a way to help children learn content and learn to be deep thinkers. So I wanna talk about that next. So what is, what is it that we're thinking about here? So I would like for you um, to stop for one second and I want to you to think about what play is to you. So take a moment, close your eyes. If you're not, if you're out walking, don't close your eyes. I, we don't want anyone walking into a tree. So close your eyes and picture a scene of playing as a child, okay? You don't have to close your eyes, I won't call on you. But think about what a great memory is for you when you were a child and you were playing. What is it that you see? So if, if you don't mind, I would love if, if some of you and anyone who wants to would share a sentence or two about what they remembered in chat. I won't call on you. I won't, I won't force you to, sometimes I feel like with my own students, I say, look, I'm not going to call on you. So don't be scared to put something in chat. But if you don't mind, I would love to just hear from some of you and from as many of you as possible, what one memory is of you as a child when you were playing. Awesome. Oh, there's some coming in. It's great. 
hi, maybe I just want to share. Sure, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It's just like I, I remember those days. Playgrounds were very different from now. So I was mm -hmm. uh, really happy, just laughing out loud, and I just wish it wouldn't end. <laughs> just having such a blast of time. Yeah, yeah. On the merry-go-round, yeah. I still remember that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, thank you for that. And I love this is um, I'll sometimes do this with students or with other talks that I give. And this is the best part of my talk, because I look out and all you see are smiles. All you see among everybody in the audience is smiles. And I think it's just like what we heard is you you could feel it, right? You actually can almost feel it in your body that that fun, right? That excitement that you had. And you see here in the in the chat, there's lots of chat coming in. So you're not going to read everything, but you can get a sense that there is so much variation here, right? There's so much variation in terms of inside, outside, climbing trees, playing with insects. With some people are by themselves, some people are with friends, right? Thinking, yeah. So I mean, we're getting such great experiences. I, I love these. I'm going, I'm definitely going back to read all of these. But what we saw here is that there's a lot of variation when we think about play. There's a lot of variation about how we experience play ourselves, what comes to us when we think about what play means. So some of you in your mind saw a single child and some of you saw children playing together. Some of you may have seen um, just children or some of you may have seen a child and a parent or a caretaker playing. Some of you saw building materials. I saw some Lego answers in there. And some of you may have pictured a group of children playing a game on an athletic field. Some of you may have seen a children playing an app or a video game or a regular board game. Some of you, I sometimes I'll get um, folks who are who either have young babies or work in speech pathology and they'll picture the vocal play that a baby does while learning to control vocal cords like that really incredibly cute vocal play that we'll sometimes see. Um, for me, the image that consistently comes to my mind is remembering what it was like. I used to turn my bike upside down as a child and use the pedals to turn a, a pretend ice cream wheel that I would use for my imaginary ice cream shop. So the fact is that defining what play is has plagued philosophers, researchers, and educators for years, right? And partly because I think we all have such a different answer. We all have such a different answer about how we experienced play and then also linking that to how does that lead to the academic and social emotional outcomes that we want for kids? And that's what we're gonna talk about today because I think that there is an answer to that. So recently an international team of collaborators and I partnered with the Lego Foundation to explore this very topic. And what we concluded was that we need to stop thinking about play as this static concept of play period. It's just this one thing, play. What we argue is that we need to start to think about play in a way that's complex and varied. And when we do that, we do play better justice and actually can use that knowledge and understanding to help guide us to thinking about what play means for kids and what it means for learning. And in fact, we know that, um, that lots of other concepts in our lives need to have this kind of dynamic view about them, right? When we think about, let's see here, come on slide. Right, there's many of these concepts that are complicated, wonderful, complex, and challenging all at the same time. Right, think about love. The love we feel for our parents is different than that which we feel for our children. Our love for our human babies is different than that which we feel for our fur babies. Our love for our favorite dessert is different than the love we have for our significant others. And if it isn't, we might have a problem, right? There's all of these concepts that we grapple with all of the time that are complicated, wonderful, complex, and challenging. And what if we apply that kind of same lens to play so it's not just seen as this static concept of play. And similarly, another way of thinking about this is thinking about the color spectrum, right? This is a continuous spectrum that we break down into categories. And what we wanted to do is examine if having this approach of thinking about play as a spectrum can better capture what we know about how children learn and how we can teach them. So what if, it is, what if we do start to think about play like a spectrum? I think on one end, we can range from a totally free, unencumbered type of play, the kinds of play that would happen if your parents sent you outside to go play until, you know, go play for an hour, go play until dinner time, or the play that you just kind of picked up when you transformed a dining room table into a fort with blankets. I was, went to my nephew's baseball game a couple of days ago, and there was this probably three-year-old who entertained himself for hours. He had a a wagon, he had a ball, and for this wagon and ball, he made up games, he was 
bowling with the ball. He drove the rag and over here. He had, he, you could see he had created these imaginary games, right? No one told him what to do. He just had this innate drive to play. But by viewing play as a spectrum, it also covers the kinds of play that happen when adults curate great experiences from providing access to a great game or providing materials that help you to create a store in your living room or a veterinary set so that you could conduct an examination on your family's dog. So this is a spectrum of play that my colleagues and I created. This spectrum encompasses various types of play from the play young children create on their own that's on the left, free play, to the play that we help them to create on, towards the middle. And what we propose is, is that these types of experiences from free play to guided playing games are all important parts of a playful learning spectrum. And it is by viewing play as a spectrum that we start to see how we can link play and playful learning to academic content-based, but then also the six C outcomes that we want, we really want to promote in our children. Here's another way um, of viewing this. So we can see here that the role of the adult and the child here fluctuates. Some of the types of play you all remembered was by yourself with just your own thoughts and the things that happened to be around you, maybe insects. Some of your play was more structured. Some of your play happened because adults helped support that situation with either their purposely chosen materials or exposure to certain contexts. So I think we can explore some of these types of play to really get a better understanding of how playful learning, different types of play can help lead us to the outcomes that we want for our kids. With free play, you'll see that the child initiates and directs. There's less structure and more choice. Children are setting their own goals in the play and following their own interests. They're often very active, exploring, asking what if. The adult might be present and interacting with children but isn't directing the outcomes. Right, so we see here that they're asking what if, reinventing ideas, creating new meanings. And really when we see what the adult does, they observe, listen to, and acknowledge children during play. And they support when children struggle, for example, if they are joining in with peer play that isn't going very well, they might help explain what children need or explain how we can interact with one another nicely. But they really take a back seat here. Children, we know, benefit from free play in that it's linked to executive functions, self-regulation, social skills, self-esteem, health, and well-being. We also know physical play is linked to spatial skills and mathematics. So we see here that these have really good outcomes that we want for our kids. They're fitting in with that 21st century view of education. Guided play, I think, is really where the magic happens. So key features of guided play is that the adult is initiating, but the child directs. There's a balance between structure and choice. The adult here is really important because they set a learning goal, but that learning goal is attuned to children's learning, like the, attuned to their needs and interests. So adults are figuring out what is it that I want children to learn or get out of this experience? But we give children a lot of power to be able to engage fully with that opportunity and that with that with that activity. So children might choose what to do and how, but not in everything in the whole world, but of this, of this curated experience, the adult is present interacting with children, but doesn't direct their actions. They, they kind of create a possibility space for children. We know that guided play can lead to higher gains in literacy, numeracy, social skills, and self-regulation skills compared even to things, even to direct instruction or free play alone. And again, the adult here is creating a play context with or for children with an embedded learning focus. So for instance, a grocery store with signs and paper money that is designed to help children engage with both literacy and numeracy. And adults here observe, build on, and extend children's thinking and ideas. So the key, one of the key distinctions is in free play, there's typically less of a learning goal. In guided play, adults set a learning goal that they want to, they want children to achieve, but children are given a lot of ability to engage with that activity fully. Right? It really gets them to engage in really powerful ways. And you'll see why I think it's so powerful in a second. Games are similar to guided play in that fun is at the forefront and children 
maintain lots of control, but there are some constraints, whether it's the rules of the game or the rules of pretend play. When we play games, we're forced to self-regulate. We have to wait our turn. We have to stop ourselves from just doing what we want all the time. And research suggests that not only do we build executive function skills like self-regulation, but we also are better able to learn things like math and language because games and play and play and learning go hand in hand. And again, we even see here things like music games leading to improved self-regulation. We're really seeing that children are given agency and choice, but then again, there's some constraints to that. So it's not just free play, everything's not just open, but the children are able to really engage joyfully and playfully with an activity. So the question then becomes, well, I've argued that playful learning is powerful. Well, why? Why is it so powerful? And I think there's a couple ways to answer that question. First, there's a really interesting concept that I learned about a few years ago by Dina Weisberg and colleagues. And what they suggested was that guided play and playful learning sets a type of psychological mise en place, which is kind of a fancy way of saying that, you know, how that's typically a culinary term about kind of like setting out the setting out all the ingredients that you need before you begin, right? Like setting everything out that you're going to need. So when we think about this kind of psychological rather than culinary mise en place, it refers to how one's stance towards a given environment places constraints on what one feels able to do within that environment and how those assessments and predispositions impact the process of preparing to act. So these contextual and dispositional factors unite to make a particular goal or a set of goals easier to reach by emphasizing some choices and downplaying or eliminating others. So the way I tend to think about it is I go back to that culinary root of this word. And if you think about trying to teach a 15-year-old to cook or a 25-year-old to cook, right? If we say, here's a $30, go into the supermarket, get whatever you want and make a great meal. Anybody who's new will be really confused. There'll be way too much to choose from. You don't know where to start. You don't know what goes together. But if we say, here are... 10 ingredients I'm going to give you, and we're going to work together, or you are going to be able to exper experiment, but I've selected 10 things that I know go together. We know that when we've kind of cut down that possibility space, so that children or the new chef kind of has a limited range of options through which they're able to explore and create and be curious, we know that they're much more likely to kind of arrive at the learning goal we want them to. So we can think about the same thing with play, that when we constrain the possibility space a little bit, we're much more likely to get children to get to the outcomes we need. It's why things like guided play outperforms free play when it say comes to things like mathematics and literacy, because we've constrained it. We've kind of, we've kind of set it up so that kids will discover what we want them to discover. So in other words, when we provide fun toys that, helps to, that help our children to learn about the fundamentals of math, we help guide them towards learning. If we take over and just give them worksheets or flashcards and that's it, it's no longer play and children aren't going to have that end of drive to do that anymore. So when we provide fun materials and support, but not take over, we can help them towards learning in a playful way. So I also, I'll get a little bit more specific in a second about why this is so powerful, but I want you to think back to the example that you gave um, of a type of play that you were holding, kind of holding close to your heart that you shared with us. And now that we've talked about the six C's, thinking about things like content, yes, like things like mathematics, literacy, but also about things like collaboration, communication, confidence, in a couple of words, if you would put into chat what you think you learned from that experience, whether it was playing with insects, playing with Legos, being by oneself, being on that playground with a merry-go-round, what do you think you learned from that? So if you can drop that into chat, I would love it. I'm seeing great stuff here. Confidence, communication, imagination, self-expression, creativity, problem solving, turn taking. Yeah, focus, that's a great one. Uh -huh, inventiveness, no fear of making mistakes, dare to explore, cause and effect perspective, ability to impact the environment, creativity, social skills. We're seeing lots of great things come in here. Motor skills, great balance, interaction, collaboration, creativity, a want to find out more. That's great. Yeah. 
numeracy and learning to take risk, curiosity, yeah, pleasure of enjoyment. You're all hitting really important things that we want kids to get, right? You're hitting really important concepts that we want children to learn. And what we said is that this really important work came by something that brought your heart joy, right? When you shared your experience, you could see, I always see this with people when they share it, they're, they light up because they remember that joy of the experience. And yet at the same time, you didn't, you weren't doing that to say, I want to build up my collaboration skills, but it just, you have this innate drive in a really powerful way. So I think that this is a really great example of why, and how play can be really critical. Because thinking through the 21st century model of education, you all are bringing up things that are in that list. So when we think now, returning back to the spectrum, we see that playful learning essentially kind of sets up this psychological mindset or needs and costs for learning. Free play, guided playing games are all fantastic pathways to learning. They're not, they're not just, they are fun, but they're not just fun. They're not just things to do to pass the time until we reach adulthood. They're not just bonus moments. Instead, the time we spend playing are powerful moments that lead to learning. Now, what you might be saying to yourself is that play is fun and sure it helps kids to develop socially, but we're faced with claims of a learning crisis, whether it's a crisis because of the pandemic or just generally, we're typically confronted with scary headlines and world education rankings that leave much to be desired for most of the globe. But I'm here to, to tell you a little bit about the research that supports the idea that play is not just something fun for children, but it helps them to learn. And crucially, it also helps them to learn things like math, science, technology, language, and scientific thinking. And again, it does so for an important reason. Play naturally harnesses the characteristics that lead to learning. We're going back to that concept of the science of learning. And we're saying play is going to naturally harness those exact characteristics that the science of learning suggests help us to learn. So in my 2015 article, my colleagues and I argued that the science of learning has told us how children learn and it's our ability and job as educators and researchers to translate this knowledge into the digital experience of children, in this case, educational apps. So in that paper, we argued for us to put education back in educational apps, and we could do so by aligning them with the pillars of learning, with these characteristics of learning I'm about to tell you about. Just as a side note, we did a follow-up to the study just a year, a year or so ago and found that most apps that are out there do not align with the pillars of learning, even this many years um, past when we published this article. But this, this work kind of formed the foundation for what I'm about to tell you about. Because soon after, after I worked with the Lego Foundation to think about the pillars of learning and how play naturally leverages these pillars and is a powerful pedagogical tool for learning. So I want us to explore these pillars of learning together. Taken together, this work suggests that there are five key pillars or characteristics of learning, five ways in which we can support learning inside and outside of school, namely when children are actively engaged or minds on in an iterative, meaningful, joyful, and socially interactive experience, we can see that learning is maximized. And it just so happens that playful learning naturally harnesses these exact characteristics. So really it did not come from, we think play is important, let's try to figure out which characteristics might be associated. It was, let's figure out what is important for learning and then discovering that play naturally leverages those characteristics. So I want us to watch a short video. This is produced by the Lego Foundation that gives us a better idea of kind of what this looks like for children in a classroom and how thinking about these characteristics can really help us think about learning for our children, whether they're five or even 15. So let's play here. So, the world no longer rewards people for what they know. Instead, the reward is for what we can do with what we know. This is the new reality our children face. Life-changing technologies, jobs that haven't even been invented, and all sorts of challenges that we can't foresee. This means that what children learn, and how they learn it, must also change to look a lot more like the way we naturally learn through play. But what does that look like in practice? Here are five characteristics of learning through play. Number one, actively engaging. So coming up with ideas or just learning something new is much more likely when you're actively engaged. Does that mean to dance or to jump around? 
Well, it could, but it doesn't have to. It's more about becoming so involved, so invested in what you're doing, that learning happens naturally. Like when children solve a real-world problem that matters to them. As they brainstorm and conduct research interviews, they're immersing themselves in the subject. Or when they demonstrate the same level of involvement with creative technologies, taking a hands-on approach, building models, and getting immediate feedback when the models are tested, these children are focused, eager to explore and challenge themselves. Number two, socially interactive. We can, of course, play and learn on our own. But when we share our ideas, something happens. We get the chance to see something from another perspective, to explain things, negotiate, and then reach a compromise. We learn to communicate and engage with others. Like these children, their handyman needs more space for his tools, and the kids have decided to help. They're tackling a problem that's relevant to them and people they care about. To actually design and build a solution together requires successful social interaction. This is a way for children to practice the most important skill for future jobs, well, and life in general, being able to operate in a team. Number three, iterative. Learning isn't always about being told how to do something correctly. Sometimes it takes a few mistakes to know how to progress. Keep trying and you'll get there in the end. This is textbook iterative learning. And here too, it's all about testing, changing something around, and then testing it again. Iteration strengthens critical thinking and reasoning. So it all leads to a deeper sense of what works and why. Number four, joyful. Learning can often take a long time and success can seem far away. Let's be honest, it's tough if you're not enjoying it. But it is a thrill to get somewhere. And as we get more involved, we chase that. Nothing spurs you on quite like the feeling you get as you're progressing. It's also about enjoying a task for its own sake. Joy is a huge motivation to continue learning. Number five, meaningful. When a task makes sense to us and builds on what we know, when we truly care, learning becomes meaningful. These children are going to remember how they went about solving the handyman's problem because it meant something to them. Learning by solving real-life problems not only benefits them as individuals, but also their families, their school, their community, and the world. When you really grasp ideas, understand how they connect, and eventually apply them in new ways, this is learning at its deepest. The world of today and tomorrow is one of challenges, but also tremendous opportunity. Gaining knowledge is one important step. Really, children need a deep understanding that allows them to apply their knowledge to different situations and then spark new ideas. This takes practice. Let's give children a chance. Let's build on how children learn through play. So hopefully one of, you've noticed a little bit about these characteristics that we know lead to learning and how play naturally kind of engages them. But, and one of the things that I really loved about that video is it didn't just show little kids, it didn't just show preschoolers, it showed a wide range of children across a wide range of contexts and settings engaging in learning through play, right? And what, 
when we think a little bit, we'll do, I'll, I'll cover each one of those characteristics just a little bit more to talk about some of the evidence that's, that exists there. Um, but what we really see here is that it's, I'm gonna start by, by talking about joyful because I think when we think about play, it needs to be there, right? When it comes to play, it isn't play if there's no joy at all. But I know that that doesn't mean that play means that kids are having fun and super joyful every moment, right? I'm guessing a lot of you, when you were playing with your friends out in the yard or on the merry go there were probably moments that you weren't so fun, that weren't so fun, or moments where you were trying to build, build a tree house or build a fort outside, and sometimes you would get frustrated. When we think about joy, we do want to think about kind of those generally joyful experiences, but also the thrill of getting something that you work hard for, of trying to build that fort or build something together. You saw in the video, the little kids playing with corn cobs, trying to build them up, right? Sometimes that's frustrating, but when you figure it out, it's a really exciting thing. And we also think about things being surprising, right? You're surprised either at yourself or what happens. So there's lots of evidence here. I've pulled out a couple of pieces of evidence that I'll share with you. Um, but there's more in um, that the paper that I wrote that you can find. It's actually open access, and I can drop a link in this during question and answer if you want to read more. So when we think about the evidence supporting the relationship of joy and learning, we know that, in fact, positive psychology is an entire field of study based in the science of joy and positive thinking. And again, so it says that there's this really rich evidence base about how how and when joy can exist and how that relates to how we, how we interact with other people and how we interact with the content and, and the world around us. And we actually, there's some other studies that suggest that if babies are surprised, these are really young babies, they're better able to learn new material immediately after. Basically as if they say, wait, that was unexpected. How do I learn more? We know that internal motivation is linked to positive affect and internal motivation is directly linked to learning. Right. I liked one of the one of the last chat messages that came through said someone said, I want to find I want to find out more. This internal motivation, I want to engage in it. I'm not just being told to do it. It's not just because I need to complete my homework, but I want to figure this out. I want to learn about it. We know that that internal motivation is directly linked to learning. And we know that neuroscientists are beginning to unravel the neural correlates of affect and surprise on learning, potentially through increased dopamine levels, which are implicated in the brain's reward center. Right? So again, we also can look at, the science of learning looks at what's happening in education, but also what's happening in neuroscience. It's looking kind of across all different fields to see kind of what comes together. And joy seems to be a really powerful mechanism for learning. We also know that active engagement is crucial. When we think about active engagement, we think about minds on deep thinking, hypothesis testing, symbolic thinking, mental manipulation, all fancy words for everything you saw in that video, right? Whether it's learning how to stack corn cobs, you know, draw things that will be used in a little store that you're going to run, um, you really start to see that this minds on active thinking, that they're not distracted, they're not just kind of sitting there. I always think about this and I talk about this with my college students a lot, where if you're really stressed or tired, you have, I'm sure I can't be the only one who's ever done the thing where you might read a page and you get to the bottom of the page and you're like, yeah, I have no idea what I just read. I have no idea what I just remembered. Right? I wasn't minds on. I was kind of going through the motions. I also didn't learn anything. Right. But when your mind's on, you're really deeply thinking, you're engaged in the material in front of you, which is really important for learning. And here's just some examples. We know that um, questioning and labeling during storybook reading equals greater comprehension for kids. We know that children in developmentally appropriate, less passive environments do well on academic outcomes and better in social outcomes. We know that note-taking, just note-taking, they people that note-take learn more than those who don't. We know that generating information rather than just reading it increases retention and transfer on fill in the blank tests. We know that children who ask questions and make observations in museums learn more than those who do not. Essentially those children who are actively engaged in thinking about the world, thinking about the content in front of them are better suited for learning, right? And we know that play naturally engages kids. In all of the examples that you gave me, you were in that moment. You were in that moment outside with your friends, down the street, whatever you were doing, you were in that moment, right? You were actively engaged, minds on in that moment. We also know that meaningfulness is really important. And this, by here, this is what we mean is connecting learning to existing knowledge, seeing it in the outside world and contextualizing learning, right? Being able to 
do a worksheet where two plus two equals four is one thing. But we know it's really important when you're when you have four pieces of candy and two kids that each person gets two pieces, right? That we think about even things like learning about what a triangle looks like, right? On a piece of paper, you might have an equilateral triangle, but we know triangles look much different than that in the real world, right? We have isosceles triangles, we see things. We want to take that knowledge and put it out into the world so that kids are seeing the content that they're learning all in the world around them, that they're developing kind of how, how all these pieces fit together. It goes beyond kind of that drilling, drill and kill um, kind of version of rote learning into this deeper learning that we see. And we know that when we think about meaningfulness, we're thinking about new information being built upon existing knowledge, us taking new information in and thinking about how it relates to what we know, maybe updating that old information and forming a better understanding of the world. We know that when children are given causally rich information, they spend more time on task than say, even just getting something like a reward, like a little sticker. Kids actually really seem to want to learn to explore. They, this is why kids ask why all the time, right? They're trying to figure out why things work the way they do. We know that learning about the function of an object supports categorization of little kid and, and babies. We know that making analogies between situations can lead to new insights about problem solving, understanding scientific principles or learning moral lessons. We know basically we forget, I think as adults sometimes that children are in this world and they want to learn. They want to find out more. And part of what they're trying to do is broaden their understanding of, of how the world works and play helps them to do that. When we think about iterative thinking, we're thinking about building knowledge through a process, not a one-time kind of deposit of here's some information, I'm the adult, I'm giving it to you, the end. But when we saw iteration, in the video, it was about hypothesis testing and seeing what will work. I'm gonna try this, that doesn't work. I'm gonna try something else. I'm gonna try something else. I'm gonna keep iterating and thinking, kind of thinking more creatively. It goes back to that creative thinking and also the confidence to try, try and try again until you understand. Um, thinking, well, this also can find some foundation in Piaget's constructivist framework, not that we are given information, but that we're constructing our understanding based on all the experiences that we have. And in fact, you know, we can think about this being really early on. I think sometimes people hear the word iteration and they say, well, this is fine. This is fine for middle schoolers. But in fact, we think this is happening. We see this happening even with babies. We know that infants can be considered scientists in the crib, constantly testing hypotheses, revising ideas, seeing if they you know, drop a pacifier over the edge of a table, if it falls and does it fall again, and does it fall again, and does it fall again, right? They're iterating, they're trying to understand the world. And there's some really cool work that shows that preschoolers will preferentially explore, um, explore a toy characterized by confounded evidence over toys without ambiguity. So if it's really easy for kids to see that A leads to B, they see it, they might do it three times and then they're done. But if A only sometimes leads to B, leads to B because maybe it needs to be done with C, they're going to try to figure out how to make the toy work, right? So we actually see that preschoolers and kids are searching to figure out how the world works. And part of what they do with that is iterate. And we see that that happens all the time in play. We also know that social interaction is really important. Um, Gergay suggested that the transmission of information between individuals acts as a kind of natural pedagogy. In other words, our best resources for learning are the people around us. And we also learn a lot by telling other people around us what we know. Right, when we give children, when we give adults the chance to collaborate, to be able to express ideas and exchange ideas, we see really powerful learning happening. We know that social interaction is optimal for learning, especially for zero to eight year olds, but is really important for all children and adults. Infants and children prioritize input and learn more from social cues compared to non-social presentations of the same information. We know that parents' contingent responses to a child's vocal play supports language development, Romani found that children, this is a really cool study where she found that children built larger, more complicated structures when they were engaged with a peer in a playful building activity compared to when they were presented with the same exact materials in an adult directed and adult structured activity. So simply by letting children experiment, collaborate, communicate, they were able to build larger, more complex structures and hence learn more. So now that we've learned all the ways in which viewing play as a spectrum helps us, it really helps empower us to think about the different ways to teach our children. 
and that these characteristics are naturally leveraged when we use play to teach children. The next step is thinking about how do we implement this across ages and contexts, right? So here we have play is really important. We can think about play as a spectrum. It's really important because it, it really leverages these characteristics that we know lead to play. So how do we do this across ages and contexts? So I'm going to briefly explore some existing models for implementing playful learning in classroom and neighborhood contexts. The most obvious place to begin to explore the role of playful learning in helping children to acquire knowledge or the six seeds, if we're going to think about it kind of more broadly, is thinking about what are children learning in school? It's the place where we naturally assume most learning happens and it's where a great deal of energy, effort, money is spent to help educate our children. And in fact, what we're starting to see is, is a change where many ministries of education are beginning to embrace whole child pedagogy. So for instance, here's a quote from the Singapore Ministry of Education stating that to achieve our mission, MOE will provide our children with a balanced and well-rounded education, develop them to their full potential and nurture them into lifelong learners and good citizens, conscious of the responsibilities to family, community, and country feels very much like 6C model. We see the same thing happening from Canada. So here we see the purpose of the program is to establish a strong foundation for learning. And this is for an early year statement and to do so in a safe and caring play-based environment that promotes the physical, social, emotional and cognitive development of all children. So what we really start to see is this quest for holistic whole child development is not just limited to one or two communities or schools or even countries. Instead, the entire world is beginning to realize the importance of educating the whole child. And as, you know, I think it's really important here to make this distinction because I think people have lots of great ideas and great goals. We wanna educate the whole child. How do you do that? And I think one of the way people, you start to see this in, in this statement about um, from Canada, from the Ontario Ministry of Education, is it's going to be play-based environment that promotes the physical, social, emotional, cognitive development, but how? I think it's the how that people really start to get confused by, partly because they don't fully understand how viewing play as a spectrum can help them. And in fact, recent publications, including many by myself and my colleague, Kathy hirsch Pasek and Roberta Golenkoff, have explored how to bring these lessons about the science of how children learn with the six C's with how children learn in classroom and also examine the evidence of their efficacy, right? It's really important to not just say, here's how we think, here's what we think happens, bye, right? We really wanna say, here's what we think happens and then how do we study that scientifically? How do we think about implementing everything we know from the science of learning into classrooms and then measuring it to make sure it's working the way we want it to? So here, what we're gonna see is, um, so Kathy and colleagues have published a book called, or have published um, a book in a program called The Ultimate Playbook for Reimagining Education, which really actually gives us this equation for equitable education. In other words, how do we apply everything we know to make education equitable, efficient, and then it works for kids, for all kids. And what, um, what Kathy and colleagues have created is this idea of an equation that the first step is to determine what it is we want children to learn embedded within our community and context. What's important to us? How, how does our, do our cultures, our beliefs, our language, our heritage, our values, how is that shaping what we want children to learn and how we want it to learn? But then how do we combine that with the five pillars of learning, with the five characteristics? How do we now think about that with the science of how children learn? And frankly, then determining and adding in that, lang that um, the learning goal. What is that we want children to learn with it for the 21st century skill? So when we combine one part community values and needs, one part the science of how children learn, and one part of what children need to learn or their learning goals, what we end up with is culturally responsive, equitive, equitable, and inclusive success for all children. So in school, the six C's allow us to reimagine what education could be, kind of giving us this report card for the 21st century. So as I talked about before, Things like collaboration, communication, content, critical thinking, creative innovation and confidence aren't just yes, no, right? You throughout your whole life progress in all of these areas, right? You see that, you know, having your community, your collaboration ability, you might be at a step one when you're four years old where you're on your own. And then you start to do things side by side. And then you go back and forth and learn how to take turns. And then you learn how to build something together. 
right? Using this grid, thinking through the six C's or any learning goal that you have, you can ask, where do you stand? Where do your children stand? Where does your school stand? And how might playful learning support those goals? How can you create lessons and activities that think about where children are now and where you want them to go and then use playful learning to get you there? And in fact, we're seeing some really positive preliminary evidence. Um, the evidence is continuing to mount with preliminary findings um, in schools in Pennsylvania and the US, finding increased performance in reading and math, which are those important content areas. I think a lot of times, sometimes society administrators start to get worried about, well, we can't lose the content and play doesn't get you to the content. I'll never forget, I was touring a children's museum and the executive director introduced me to one of their board members for a children's museum. And I was talking about learning through play. And they said, well, but kids need to learn. They need to, they need to learn, they can't just play. And I, I couldn't believe that they were on the board of a children's museum because they are learning when they're playing. So we had a lot of work to do. I worked with them and worked with their board to kind of understand what learning through play means. So it's not that learning through play just gives you the social emotional skills, just learn, it's just something fun, right? We actually see it, it increasing and being really beneficial for content areas, but then also for things like, we saw a decrease in referrals for occupational therapy, and we saw um, fewer referrals for special education services, and teachers were happier. We also see <laughs> similar results are found in Michigan in the United States, yeah, where the playful know. learning curriculum was added to a community school district in which the majority of children faced economic challenges. We also see this work expanding internationally. And these are just some examples. There's lots of work out there that's suggesting that there's this new way of thinking about education and that playful learning is one of the most powerful tools we have for getting us there. So I think that we can think about how do we take all these lessons into the classroom, but we also have to think about the fact that school is only one part of our children's lives. It's not, it's not the only thing we have, right? We also know and can ask if playful learning can provide opportunities in communities. So if we actually look, um, this is um, from the US, but I think this is pretty common across multiple contexts, we actually see that a lot of time is spent outside of school. We tend to think a lot about what's happening in school when we think about education and learning, but what about the times when children aren't in school? Can we take any lessons from the science of learning and from playful learning and think about how do we infuse our neighborhoods, infuse our communities to create playful learning opportunities to leapfrog learning? So it's not just learning as something happens at school, but it's also something that just happens everywhere we go. So I'm part of an organization that's called Playful Learning Landscapes. I'm a science advisor for them. And what we want to do, and what we do is we ask how we can transform everyday spaces into fun learning spaces where families live, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their communities. So we started by asking, when is a bench not a bench? How is it that we can take an everyday kind of situation, whether it's a street corner, a bench, you know, a corner, of our homes, a corner of our classrooms, a corner of a museum. How can we transform those spaces, use what we know from the science of learning to be able to maximize learning? So I wanna tell you a little bit about our process and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the projects that we've done, just so you can get some own ideas, your own ideas about how you could do this in your classrooms, your homes and your communities. So Playful Learning Landscapes Action Network or PLAN uses a community-based co-constructed design process that directly involves community members to solicit their ideas, their values, and their objectives. When we go back to that equation, remember we were thinking about those values, our cultural values, kind of being the thing that we start with. Then we use the science of how children learn and combine it with a focus on these 21st century skills, the what of learning, and ask how we can transform community spaces into hubs of playful learning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a short video um, that talks about one of the big one of the big first projects that we did was the Urban Thinkscape project, and you'll see here kind of how community centered this project was and and our approach. I think jumping feet is one of the favorites. Right, right here, let's restart that one. Here we go.
Urban Thinkscape is a project that attempts to take places in the world and turn them into opportunities for parents and children to talk to each other and to engage in playful learning together. The bus stops, the supermarkets, the streets where people walk. Imagine, what would a bench look like if it had a puzzle? The kids could play while they were waiting. They would be engaged in spatial learning, the precise kind of spatial learning that our science tells us builds mathematical and spatial knowledge and helps you at the doorstep of formal schooling. The thing that excites me the most is that we're bringing a new energy into the community. We're bringing life into the community and it also gives the uh, people in the community an opportunity to see some positive development, to be able to add value and to be able to let people in the community know that there are people that are interested in their learning experience. I was a lobbyist at first to get this project in the Belmont community. That was the first step. It was introduced and everyone's hands went up. I want it, I want it, I want it. It's very important not to impose on the community, but to become a trusted member of the community. And I feel that this project is really a fabulous example of co-creation. I think it's really important because I get to speak for my community. People have voice in this. And they picked a lot. And on that lot, where Martin Luther King had given a speech for the Freedom March, we were going to build the very first urban thinkscape. It's a small but meaningful area. It's the gateway to the Belmont community. And right there was a bus stop, waiting to be transformed into something that could help and be owned by the entire community. I've been very excited to think about how we can actually get families and parents sort of engaged in the research process and how that might affect their relationships and their just sort of involvement with their family and also their wider communities. I was able to work on recruiting some community members who are interested in being employed by the project to collect data. So there's an extensive training process to learn how to do naturalistic observation, to administer surveys. I learned in my training how to talk to people and what questions to ask and do surveys. I'm really excited to see it sort of come to fruition. I've seen this empty lot for like almost two years and I'm ready to see Urban Thinkscape on that lot. The grand opening for the Urban Thinkscape project was very exciting. It drew a lot of people. It was high energy. The grand opening had state senators, city council people, and most important, it had people and kids from the neighborhood. They were dancing, they were singing, they were playing, and they helped build what they were playing with. Over a hundred kids from the neighborhood helped build Urban Things Game. I like the design. I like the fact that it's a landmark. It's going to be a part of history. It's something that people can look back and say, I remember when that was not there, and now we've added something special to our, our area here. Urban Thinkscape is built on our appreciation of the science about how learning is fueled through play. There are four installations. The first one is Puzzle Wall, which runs alongside 40th Street and features four different puzzles. The images for those were chosen by the community members. The point of Puzzle Wall is that it's going to foster spatial skills, and we know that spatial skills are important for later math skills, and also just encouraging those kinds of 
critical interactions between kids and adults. Good job. Good job. High five. Then there's stories, which is designed around these icons laid out on a wooden deck so kids can kind of climb around these different peaks. The goal is that you follow the icons and you can tell a story based on them. That installation is designed to focus on narrative skills, which are part of literacy, and then also social emotional skills. I think Jumping Feet is one of the favorites. It looks a lot like a hopscotch game. There's two, two different runs of Jumping Feet. And then we have a little sign that suggests, okay, can you put one foot where there's two feet and two feet where there's one foot? So that's building some executive function skills, getting kids to sort of stop and think and inhibit some of their responses and figure out how they can follow the pattern. And then there's hidden figures, which is these sort of massive metal panels, and in them are hidden some images. There's a strawberry, and there's some other pictures that then reflect on the ground when the light shines through. Or you can also just look up into the metalwork and see the images. What do you see? What shapes do you see? Or do you see anything? I think I see a strawberry. You see a strawberry? <laughs> Where? Where do you see it? And that again is also supposed to support spatial skills since they have to find and identify these things. Now remember what he did. He was managing up the big dots. Did I get it right? Yep. I saw a young family and I noticed how each area of the playground or the play area space, they follow one another. So there was a lot of learning, follow me, look up here, get in front of me, move to the side. So I thought that was really, really heartwarming for me. If we can get installations like Urban Thinkscapes around the country, it won't be a panacea, but it will surely help families understand the importance of joyful interaction with their children and how it can reduce their own stress. If we can create that, I believe that we'll create learning cities. And if we create learning cities, then we've married city revitalization and early education for all families, rich and poor. I really, I think that that's a really great example of one of our first projects that really wanted to think about targeting these everyday spaces. And there's research out about all the, the following four examples I'm going to give you, but I'll summarize it for you, which is that in Urban Thinkscape, we saw an increase in verbal engagement. We saw an increase in caregiver child interaction. We saw increased language overall and increased language for STEM related content in these spaces compared to what it looked like before the installation was put in. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is this, this was a pretty elaborate installation, but we can think about taking those same principles to revitalizing corners of our classrooms, walkways in our schools, places in our homes, thinking about how are the ways that we can just nudge these really high quality interactions that are, that are based in play and based in high quality interaction. We can also think about, here's another couple examples. There was another um, example called Parkopolis in which Andy Bustamante and colleagues essentially created a giant human-sized board game. And this um, board game can actually travel, it can go into different places around the city. This is um, at the Police Touch Museum, which isn't located in Philadelphia. But there were all sorts of different activity cards. Children could um, say, roll a die to be able to figure out how many spaces to go. And there was a manipulation so that the little kids could go one space, two space, three space. But for older kids, they could go three quarters of a space, one third of a space. They were working with fractions to be able to understand Kind of how that works, right? It, again, we're seeing an increase in verbal engagement, caregiver child interaction, an increase in physical activity, and an increase in STEM related language. And in this case, this was compared to another science related exhibit at the same museum. So there really seems to be something really important about thinking about engaging with our children in play 
because it's harnessing that joy, it's harnessing that actively engaged, meaningful, socially interactive, joyful, iterative characteristics. Another example, the very first example um, in this kind of sphere came from Supermarket Speak, which looked at what happens if in a supermarket, we create signage that helps promote high quality interactions between parents and children. We, in this case, we saw an increase in both the quantity of verbal engagement and the quality of verbal engagement. We saw an increase in terms of conversational turns and an increase in positive valence when the signs were up versus in the very same stores when the signs were down. This was in a, and this was in a lower income area. Finally, Play and Learn Spaces is another project that I worked on with Brenna Hassinger Doss and colleagues. And we did the exact same thing in the children's library where the before picture was a regular children's library where there were rows of books, places to sit, kind of the end. And we asked what happens if we take this informal learning space and infuse playful learning opportunities. So you see here, we have a climbing wall in one example and you can't see, but at each, um, at each kind of foothold and handhold, there's letters. So children could spell things out as they climbed. You see here that there's a dramatic play area where they can act out the stories of what they're reading with their friends. We actually here see an increase in child caregiver interaction. We saw a decrease in child technology use. We saw an increase in time spent in the space and an increase again in that positive valence um, by children and adults to be able to see that this was not just a place to go, it was a joyful place to go that also had all these kind of positive outcomes. And again, there's this strong research base. There's lots of research out there looking at these kinds of installations and finding really positive effects. So taking it back a step, what we see is that we're returning to Kathy's equation for thinking about an equitable education. We see that we can combine our cultural values with the science of how children learn and what we want children to learn and infuse playful learning across context in our schools, in our communities, in our homes, and our libraries with children of varying ages and adults too. So again, kind of the take home message and my final and conclusion thoughts is thinking that we need to really think about what the goals of a 21st century education are. We need to think about how playful learning, how free play guided playing games can support that learning and development. And it does so through engaging joyful, actively engaged, meaningful, iterative, and socially interactive experiences. And it's through the leveraging of those principles about how humans learn that we see the power of playful learning and we see that it's working across contexts and ages as well. So that's the, this is kind of the whole talk put together in one slide. And I would love at this point to ask too, if there are any questions um, from anybody in the audience, I'd love to take them. Thanks for all of your attention. Thank you, Jennifer. That was really sure. so fun to watch and to listen to. Sure. Does anybody have any comments? You know, I mean, if you don't want to ask a question, that's fine too. We can make this quite um, interactive and just discussive. Hi, can I just check? I understand it starts with free play. Is it like a la lateral, like we must start with free play followed by guided play games or how much of each should we pay more attention to? Is there a rule of thumb or something? Right, it's a good question. And I think part of it likely varies with age, right? So I think if you're thinking about, a, you know, a, it, I think it relates to what your age is and then also what your learning goal is. So if you think, you know, you have a learning goal, you really want to make sure literacy and mathematic kind of learning goals are met, you're going to rely less on free play and more on guided playing games. If you want to help make sure that, you know, you're noticing that the children in your class are really struggling with communication and collaboration, you might want to increase the amount of free play time that you give them. So I think it's not so much that, you know, one is better than the other and you should never have free play. You always have to have guided play or vice versa. I think each type of play has a place in classrooms. And that's again, where we think about the importance of the adult to think about what children need and also what your capacity is, right? If you're teaching a class of 80 children, you may not be able to just open things up for free play because you just can't manage it. So kind of thinking through what that looks like for your classroom, your own constraints, but then also what your learning goal is. Um, and what you want, what you want children to achieve.
So does that answer your question? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great question. Jennifer, in the chat box, somebody's asking to have a look at the slide again that uh, displays the 21st century learning goals. So the, the slide this, yes. this goals of education slide. Is that yes, Soothing. And then it relates to the six C's, maybe that. Six C's, maybe that. So Soothing was the one who posted this. Uh, is this what you wanted, Soothing? Okay. Yes. Okay. Sure. Does a question come in from Tianwei? Which type of play should be emphasized at home and how best to implement it? Um, she's asking as a parent of a four-year-old. Thanks. Okay, a four-year-old only child. That's a great, it's a really great question. And I think, you know. For me, there, you want, you're, you're going to do everything. You're going to do some free play when you need to do something. You need to make dinner. You need to do something on your own. Um, you, want, you also want your children to have the ability to discover what they are interested in and, and pick up what they're interested in. But I also think when we think about guided play, that can be infused into everyday circumstances. So thinking through that supermarket speak example, when you're walking through the supermarket with a child, you talk about... Um, I'm sorry, can you mute? I'm getting some feedback. Let's see. Awesome. Okay, let's see if that fixed it. Um, but when you're walking through the supermarket, when you're going through the house, you can create fun games that help achieve learning goals. So you can think about how do you achieve literacy goals? How do you count off all the ingredients you're making for dinner? That's a way to infuse guided plan to kind of an everyday experience. And I think that you can take the lessons and not say, you know, three to 4 p.m. is my guided play time. Like, but think about how do you just build that into your everyday life. Um, so you're going to do a lot of, you're going to do free play and you're also going to guided play in games, I think, really dynamically throughout the day. So hopefully that helps answer the question. That helps answer the question. Lynette has her hand up. Uh, yeah, hi. I wanted to ask, so sometimes I, so as a teacher in a school, sometimes I plan guided play sessions for the children, but then um, children may not, uh, follow what I plan for them to do and then halfway they find they pick up the elements of the play themselves and then it becomes a free play session sometimes I let it just you know run on their I mean let them just run on their own sometimes I kind of want to bring them back to what I was trying to do but then I might frustrate it I might frustrate them and frustrate myself in the process so I'm wondering how do you determine what are some of the factors you think about when you make a decision on whether you want to stop that, change it back to a guided yeah, play session or just allow them to just play. That's a great question. Um, great question. Um, Serene, do you mind trying to mute? I think I'm getting feedback from your audio. Let's see if that fixes it. I'm getting, I don't know if anybody else. Okay, I think it fixed it for me. Um, so I think that's a really great question. And I think what you just demonstrated is, is exactly why teachers are so important because like you said sometimes you you follow you say okay I'm, I've created this great guided play experience and then it just went off in another direction and how do you determine do I let it go or do I kind of bring things back and I think what you're what you're describing is incredibly skillful um it's an incredible skill and incredibly skillful way of facilitating play because you you have to learn when to step back and when to push right when to bring them back to the activity because you need them to acquire a learning goal. And I think what you what you said is really important, which is that you step back and you kind of look to see what they're doing. And I think when the factor that I look at is thinking about if I step back and look at what they're doing, are they getting closer to what the goal of that activity is or something that I really value in terms of that learning goal um, that was intended? Or maybe I say, oh, they've, they went a different direction, but I really want them to continue following that. Or have they just gotten distracted and we've kind of gone into a little bit more of a chaos thing? And I think that's that's what it comes back to is stepping back and kind of thinking and being kind of using the critical thinking skills you have to determine, are they getting closer to where I want them to get to or not? And that's, that's one of the benchmarks that you can use. And then I think you can also then be reflective after the practice to try to determine maybe where and how things went off track. And maybe you need to give them a little bit, maybe you need to constrain that possibility space a little bit more. 
um, or listen to see where, where their interests went and use that, use kind of where they went off to when they kind of took a left turn and figure out, can you use anything that you learned from watching that as you design that next activity? And I think this is where it comes back to why teachers are so critically important because teachers do this naturally and they are really reflective about their practice. So I think what you described is exactly what you want to do, which is sometimes you let it go and you sometimes decide, nope, this is, we've gone way too far off course. Now let's think about bringing that back and then using those lessons to develop your next activity. So hopefully that helps answer your question some. Yes, it does. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that was a great question. Jennifer, there are two questions related to urban theme space. One sure. by Bing Luan, who's asking if the project is found in many states in the USA. And Mian Yi's question is really more about how the communities come together to do the project and how they engage. Sure. So urban thingscape there that the original urban thingscape kind of that model with those exact um, installations is just in Philadelphia, but there are lots of projects across the United States and now actually going um, internationally through the Playful Learning Landscapes Action Network. So whether that is transforming street corners, um, we've done some work in laundromats, we've done, they're doing work right now in homeless shelters. We've done some work, um, that group has done some work in um, homes for um, like families that are experiencing domestic violence, so shelters. So we're really expanding into lots of different areas to be able to think about how do we infuse everyday spaces, whether it's a street corner in Philadelphia or a laundromat in Chicago. We're working with lots of community groups that are looking to do that. So it's not just in Philadelphia, there's lots of different places. And I think we're actually in the, in the process of creating a map so that you can kind of see where these installations are, are going and there's been a lot of work too internationally. Um, and you should check out the Playful Learning Landscapes Action Network website. Um, and I can share that um, with you, Serene. And if we have a second, I'll drop that into chat when I finish answering. So that way I can drop some information in. Um, I'd be happy to do that. And was that, oh, and then with the community groups, we usually actually have community meetings. So we will go into a community and ask them, you know, what is it that they want? What is it that they value? What is it that they would love to see that space look like? When we did the play and learn spaces, we did, we held, um, our, our colleagues held um, kind of these really fun creation sessions where we just brought in lots of different materials, paint, cardboard, colored, like colored paper, glue sticks, glitter, and we asked children to build what they wish that the library space looked like. And then we took some of that inspiration to be able to infuse that into the spaces, right? And that's that's really lofty goals, right? We couldn't do everything they wanted to do. We couldn't put a pool in the library, but we were able to learn what kind of what, what was really important to them and what they were interested in. So we really got some community buy-in because I think it's important for for a space to feel organic and for a space to feel like it's a part of a community, not here's this thing that was transported onto the street corner that has no connection to me or the people that I love. So it was really important in that way. Man Yi and Beng Wan, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Excellent, sure. thank you. Okay, great, great. So Sumin has something in the chat box. Um, one of the children in my class dislikes guided play experience and prefers to sit out and read. He prefers free play experiences when there's construction. How can I interest him in guided play experiences so he learns collaboration and positive communi communication skills? That's a great question. I'm curious if I think um, what I read from that is a teacher who is really like you've already picked out what is interested in, what that child's interested in, right? So it's kind of like, okay, some of this guided play stuff, I'm a little bit nervous, whether it's the social interaction, but I'm curious, you said, so he prefers free play experiences when there's construction. So I'm curious if there's a way to create a lesson that's a more guided play lesson around construction so that it goes kind of into that space that that child is kind of feeling safe and feeling interested and excited about, and then using that as a way to maybe bridge into a guided play experience. So thinking through, is there a way in your math lesson or in a literacy lesson to think about construction? So thinking about, um, you know, is there a way to build something with shapes 
that kind of gets you to the guided play. I'm trying to help my children learn about shapes, but goes into construction because we know that that's something that that child likes. It gives that child a chance to, to shine. I mean, I think what I'm reading from that is also a teacher who's really skillful because they're learning what that child's interested in. And I think the next step is thinking, how do I take all of that lessons that I learned, those lessons that I learned and use that to maybe design an activity that's, that helps that child to make those connections with their peer because we, you're already knowing what, maybe what that access point is for that child. So hopefully, um, if I, hopefully that answers your question. Let me know if it doesn't. Yes, I mean, yeah, um, feel free to unmute. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Because um, we, in my school, we do have um, like neighborhood areas where we try to bring um, the neighborhood into the school. Like we have like a supermarket, set up and the hair salon set up and usually this child you know he will um respond like I don't want to play and then he gets disruptive I, I just want to sit and read but when I open a construction corner then um he gets very excited then you can and then um he starts being very engaged so uh, what I was trying to do was trying to get him more involved in the um like neighborhood experiences to be involved and he wouldn't be so distressed he, that he learns and gets gets to play along with everybody else yeah but it's given me some food for thought that maybe when i'm designing other play experiences maybe something that's more um shapes or more like maybe a 10 gram area would be better for him yeah thank you Right, and maybe there's a way to create um, a tangram area or a shape area where you maybe you need two people to build together to be able to mm -hmm. achieve something, right? So maybe that goes so that there's the construction that he's already interested in, but then we're adding in a little bit of social interaction. Or maybe you see what he's reading and what are the books that he's reading? And is there a way to use any of that content to, to think about an activity that might be able to bring him in with his classmates? So I think you're, you're being so thoughtful and that's exactly what, that's exactly why teachers are so critically important. I can't, I kind of can't say it enough about how important teachers are. Um, because you're the ones doing this really skillful work. As you know, you can design a great activity and it might work for one kid and not for anybody else or vice versa, right? There's not, every child is different and teachers are navigating that space really dynamically every day. Yeah, thank you. Sure. And I saw another question in the chat about um, what are my thoughts about learning through purposeful play? So it's often being interpreted as planning with a purpose. If we're privileging the adult's purpose over the children's purpose, and how do we balance the power during playful interactions? Aline, I think that's a really great question. And I think it's part of why thinking about free play having a real role in kids' lives too, because it, it opens them up and takes the power away from adults too. And the other thing is with guided play, which is a little bit more, I think. I think purposeful play sometimes and guided play are kind of seen similarly, but we have to remember that with guided play, children are still kind of given the activity, um, given the role of this, the decider in the activity. So it's not completely taken over by adults. So there, there's another slide that I sometimes use that looks at what we call co-opted play, which is when it's like, we kind of design it to be play, but then the adult takes over um, too much. The adult overtakes it and it's not play anymore. We call it co-opted play. The other way, um, that very funny way that people talk about it too, is they call it chocolate covered broccoli. So it's kind of like, well, it's going to be playful, except it's not really. It's just kind of like a playful worksheet, which isn't really play, right? It's kind of like kind of pretending to be play. So I think it's really about kind of having a mix of guided play, free play to give children that voice, give children that agency, which can be really important too in developing a lot of that confidence skills as well. So Elaine, hopefully that answers your question or I'd love to hear your thoughts if it doesn't. Does anybody else have any comments or questions for Jennifer? Yes, Tenet. Just go ahead and unmute. Uh, I can't hear you. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, right. The question I have in mind, I already put, uh, put in the chat box was, uh, we have this, uh, I have this uh, child who's very passive, right? And then uh, it takes quite a lot of prompts to get him to play. So how do we turn from 
this child who's who's generally very passive to becoming more more engaged because uh, we've been trying all sorts of different sort of uh, interests and it's just not it's just not not picking it up. Is there something like something that we could kickstart it somehow? Hmm. When you say that you looked at, so you've tried to see what his internal interests are already. Like you tried to, is there something he's naturally drawn to? Uh, can't really seem to, can't really seem to identify. I mean, like he's slightly drawn to, but it's not like like you can really see it immediately. But is there something that we could probably try to start, kick start it somehow? If he's in free play, what does he do? Does he just sit there? Yep, yeah, pretty much. Oh, that's, that's hard, right? That's really, I mean, I think I, I, there's not a magic, there's kind of like not some magic I can give you to sprinkle into that to be like, here's how to figure out exactly what that is. I think by providing lots of different options to see if he starts to naturally gravitate towards anything, if in, I don't know how, what grade you're talking about, like if in the writing or reading that he does, in the drawing that he does, if anything starts to come out there, I don't know if talking to parents about what he's interested in, you know, I think you're you're doing everything you can, right? Which is it sounds like you're giving lots of opportunities for him to express interests, and he might just not be there yet. I'd also be curious if he's, um, if it is it like social situations that are making him uncomfortable. Like, is he better one on one? Is he better with a small group, or is he just kind of like I'm just going to sit there and I'm not engaging with anything? As long you're not, as long he he benefits a lot from from one to one. Like mm -hmm. that's the only thing that he could learn. Even trying to do academic work is one one to one. Uh, so that's that's the situation. And also, the the second question I have in mind is how do you encourage a child to do uh, what's that term? It, it, iterative, mm -hmm. iterative play. Because quite a lot, quite often, uh, the kids in uh, in my in my class or the class that I've been asked to help in, uh, like when they fail something, they just throw a fuss. Yeah, I think. You know, I, I think part of it is a little bit of where adults can come in. Like, so if you're, you know, playing, um, if like, let's say they're playing with blocks to create a, um, to create something, to create a goal, you want to create a tower. It's also about asking the questions like, well, what would happen if you did X, Y, and Z? So it's a little bit about getting them to think about not just, like you said, like kind of hurry up doing something and it's done, but how do you get them to kind of experiment a little bit more and being a little bit more open-ended in, in, um, the examples that you give. So, I mean, I think iterative thinking, we think a lot about in terms of scientific thinking, like hypothesis testing, like we're going to test this and then we're going to try something a little bit different. And then we're going to try something a little bit different. Another thing that could be helpful is modeling that thinking out loud for kids in your classroom. So thinking through, you know, if you're going to demonstrate something, you demonstrate one way to do it. And then you say, and then there's this other way I think I could do it. Let me see what happens if I do this. So you might find that modeling also helps them to get into that mindset of trying things and then trying to do it a little bit differently, maybe. It's hard when I'm not in your classrooms. I don't know your grades. I don't know your students. So it's, no, it's I'm okay. trying to follow the general. It's okay. No, it's okay. General. It's okay. All right. Well, that's, a quite a, that's quite a fair bit to think about. Oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Just now that when I mentioned about that child who, if it's free play, he does not he does nothing. But there was one interest that he seems to have have a knack for stacking stuff as high mm. as possible. Is that something that we could expand from there? Um. So I mean, you could do. Let's see. You could. I'm curious if there's ways to think about like if he's interested in construction because it sounds a little bit like construction right of thinking about how you build things, how you build things tall. I would probably engage him in thinking maybe about like reading a book about building a tall tower, right? Thinking about in, in when he's creating a tower, making sure that if you're interacting with him using lots of spatial words, like tall, like left, right, above, over. Um, I'm trying to think of what other, so like construction play, thinking about construction, um, reading, reading a book about architects, right? Like there's ways that you might be able to find kind of like how do you, when we build a tower, are there ways to maybe also say, you know, what happens if we have two towers, I build one and someone else builds another, or we're going to take turns building a tower. So you get one piece and then another kid gets another piece, right? And that's going to be hard for a child who doesn't really want to engage with others, but maybe just little kind of meeting him where he is and then just push, seeing if you can push him just a little bit further might be helpful. You're so, you're, I can tell you're so thoughtful, which is exactly what you need to do. And I think it's going to just be a lot of, try. it's going to be a lot of iteration of yourself, I think. I'm trying to try one thing, <laughs> trying something else, and then trying something else. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. You can you saw sure. it. <laughs> no, but it's so true. I mean, I, I I always present these characteristics as this is how kids learn, but it's how adults learn. It's how I learn. It's when I when I create experiences for my college students. I think about these characteristics in mind. I think about it even for myself when I'm trying to learn something new. Like, am I making sure that I'm learning from other people or interacting with other people? Am I experimenting and my mind's on? Like, these are all characteristics about how humans learn. So it's the same characteristics that you're trying to get your kids to learn in your classroom are the same things that are helping you learn how to teach your kids in your classroom. All right, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Sure. Josh. Thank you so much for your question. I'm gonna jump, I'm just gonna get the Learning Landscape Action Network um, website for you all. Thanks, Jennifer, that would be great. So I'm afraid everybody, we've kind of uh, hit the 10.30 mark by now, but I do see um, one more question by Karen um, that could be answered. So Karen has a question about learning corners, Karen Chu. Okay. Oh yeah, about learning corners, right, versus provocations. I'm not anti any of those. I think it really depends on the classroom. It depends on the teacher, how the teacher feels positive about facilitating. I think, you know, learning corners, yeah, each um, representing one learning domain, discovery of the world, numeracy. I think that's I don't, I don't see a problem with it, but I think that you also have to, sometimes I, I've seen learning corners be a thing where it's kind of like, kids just go out and do their work and teachers are not engaging in any of it, right? They're just kind of like, they're in one space and the kids are in the corners and then they do that for half an hour and then it's over. And I think part of, um, Serene, like you said in the beginning, part of where this is so important is that teachers, you know, need to, they need to do this really firm dance between being engaged, but taking a back seat. So you don't want to take a back seat that you don't know what kids are doing or kind of how they're engaging but you also don't want to take over. So it's kind of popping into the learning, into each corner to see what's going on. Maybe to identify what's working well and what's not, or what children are struggling or, or who, who isn't struggling, who might be really excelling that you can kind of point that out. So I think, you know, that's an okay thing. And I think it's really about teachers discovering what works for their classroom, what works for the constraints of their classroom and their students, right? I think every, every probably, elementary school educator, but even college educator will say, sometimes things work great in one class and it doesn't work in, the, in a different class, right? And thinking through part of it's gonna be the constraints, part of it's the students too. So I think it's really listening and learning because a lot of what teachers do is they take a step back to see what's working for their classroom and what isn't. So I think as long as you're reflective and responsive, you're probably doing the right thing. Yeah, there's really no secret formula. That's why working with human beings is so exciting because it's new every day and you discover something about yourself as well as about the children that you work with. So um, I really have to close this session because I know Jennifer is really late for you where you are right now. It's 10.30 p.m. for you. It's bedtime. So thank you so much for taking the time. And um, everybody, I have um, posted in the chat box that this is recorded. And we will, once our university, you know, puts it up on the university's YouTube channel, it will be available. We will be in touch with you and let you know about it. Okay. The meantime, do check out our next lecture and hope to see you again. Goodbye. Have a very good weekend, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Saturday. And play. The sun is up. It's not raining anymore. Go out and play. <laughs>